as a baby, Grant was very tiny. He was only five pounds when he was born. He got um, a little Lego set, I think, when he was about three. And he loved Legos as a child. That was his most favorite thing. When he was a little bit older, maybe about four or five, Grandma gave him a little screwdriver. That was the end of any complete toys. He took everything apart. My interest in robots started when I was really young. And the very first thing was Star Wars. I think that's, I was seven years old when Star Wars came out. Seeing uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO, robots that, that people interacted with in a very personal way that were uh, brave and helpful and had personalities. I think when I saw that on screen, it made a, a big impression on me. And that's where it all started from there. I was like, I, I really like robots and that's what I want to do when I grow up. My name is Grant Mahara, and I'm Japanese-American. I go to the University of Southern California, where I'm a junior in electrical engineering. Um, how did you first hear about Here and Now? Uh, I saw some flyers around campus, and I gave John a call, and he said, well, come out and uh, try out. So, I did. so what made you get involved? Well, I think it seemed like a lot of fun, really, and I needed a creative outlet, you know, other than engineering. It's, uh, Sometimes it's pretty boring. So the first time I met Grant uh, was in EE 349 class, junior year. Uh, it was required class for all electrical engineering majors. So everybody, all the double E's junior year were going to be there. In his junior year, apparently he was having a very difficult time. And he was moping around the house to the point where I thought, no, you're going to tell me what's going on. And so I sat him down and I said, tell me. And he said, oh, mom, I dropped out of school. I went, oh, is that all? That's okay. Um, you can have a year to find out what you want to do and just go ahead and I will support you every way. Uh, but at the end of a year, if you haven't decided to go back to school, you'll have to go to work or, you know, do something like that. He went on to use that time, and that's when he met Tom Holman of the THX Sound System, and the rest is history. In the early 1990s, I was a professor of cinema at USC. One day, a young man came to me who'd been directed to me by a counselor. He was on the verge of dropping out of double E because he just found it to be all too much for him and he couldn't see the point. And what he wanted to do was engineering for the arts or move to cinema altogether. Well, that wasn't in the cards because of the restrictions at USC. But on the other hand, he could come to work for me. With that, I had full access to all the classes that he taught, including Cinema 241, which is like the audio class for, for filmmakers, where you learn about how the basics of sound in films, and, and all his TA classes, and the sound department, and, um, and he would give me things to read, and take me to meetings. I mean, he was awesome. 
I highly recommend getting a mentor, people out there. So. A summer internship came up at Lucasfilm. And he said, I'd like to apply for this, but of course there are hundreds and hundreds of people who apply. How can I get noticed? Will you write me a letter of recommendation? And I said, oh, don't worry about it. Just have, have them ask me. So Tom was instrumental in giving every opportunity to Grant to succeed in the field that he loved. And he is credited, I believe, as the best mentor anyone could have to give an opportunity to someone and give them a career, a love, a life. He was our first intern to join our small little group of passionate people, and I was the director, then general manager at the time. He came to us with such a dedication and enthusiasm, as well as smarts, engineering, nerdy smarts, um, that we all benefited from his work ethic and his passion for excellence. Uh, one of the great strange things was that uh, these the Japanese companies in particular thought he was a real enigma uh, because here was this guy with this Japanese name, young guy, telling them what to do, telling them when their equipment wasn't any good, uh, and he was always very gentle about it, very smart, very intelligent, uh, but it was definitely some, sort of a cultural surprise uh, for those folks. Uh, I was an ILM model maker at the time, and I was working closely with our good friend Don Bees, who was the archivist. And uh, we were preparing a bunch of objects to go to on a tour of Japan. So we were doing the restoration on a lot of models and props. So I invited him over to the archives, and he, you know, got to see the stuff. And then I eventually found out that he was. Uh, he was uh, an electrical engineer, and I'm like, hey, you know, R2 could certainly use some upgrades. We had 1980s technology, let's bring him into the 90s. So Don was able to, uh, to secure permission from the powers that be and uh, that allowed Grant to come up and actually upgrade our R2-D2 to 90s technology at the time. We started to do character appearances. There was a big licensing summit coming up, and so, uh, I'm looking at Grant one day and I'm thinking, huh, I bet you he could fit into it. So I asked him to come up to the archives, let's try it. And he did, he fit into it. Oddly enough, his legs were too short. He was the right height, but his legs were too short. So he was long in the body and short in the legs. He, uh, his, um, certainly his talents lent him to wanting to be, uh, to work at ILM time. And I remember how, uh, difficult of a time it was for, for Grant to make that move from a, a steady full-time job to a job that was essentially project to project. And he asked if he could speak with me. And I said, sure, come on in. So he came into my office, he sat down in front of my desk, and he proceeded to tell me that he's torn and tortured by the fact that he got offered a new position, a new job opportunity at ILM and that he didn't want to abandon the THX team and he didn't know what to do. And I said, this is what you wanted to talk to me about? And he said, yes. And I said, Grant, are you ready for this opportunity? Are you ready to fly? And he said, yes, I think I am. And I said, well, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. One of my claims to fame is that I hired Grant Imahara on his first project at ILM. And he fit right in and there was never from that day on, there was probably never a choice that uh, he was not going to be at ILM. I met Grant Imahara at ILM in 1996. Uh, we worked together there. Uh, we stayed there a lot of late nights building battle bots and competing on that show together. We got this nine channel Futaba remote, the kind that all the people at ILM had, and we had no idea how this thing worked. Um, so we thought we would talk to Grant, but we were a little intimidated because he worked at ILM, and he'll never have time for us. But that couldn't have been further from the truth because when we w worked up the courage to go talk to him, he's instantly like, oh, come on guys, sit down, I'll show you how it works. And you know, within about an hour, we knew all the bells and whistles of the remote. Grant shepherded us through the whole process. And by the end of the conversation, we had a new buddy. You know, one of the greatest things about Grant was that he never really let it go to his head. He was always down to earth. He always treated everybody with respect. Uh, I remember going to dinner with him not too long ago, actually, and, and he was telling me about 
uh, when he met uh, Elon Musk and he said, uh, the most interesting, he goes, that guy is smart. And anybody that uh, uh, Grant would think was smart, you knew was super intelligent. I first met Grant Imahara in 1999 at the very first BattleBots. We both showed up with combat robots there to beat up other robots. He and I became fast friends, not only because we enjoyed beating up robots, but because we were also special effects artists. So we had sort of a similar career paths. I was working um, at Industrial Light and Magic in the model shop. It was my first uh, job there and I was super nervous. And I walked through the door and all of a sudden I see what I thought was like a kid. I mean, he looked like a teenager wearing a lab coat and glasses. And he just kind of walked up and was like, hey, I'm Grant, welcome to the model shop. And it literally just put me at ease. And you know, Grant was good like that. He, he really um, could read the room and make people feel comfortable. And who knew that we would continue our careers um, for the next, you know, couple decades. Uh, you know, we, I left ILM to go work on Mythbusters and we were rooting for him to come be a host on the show. When Mythbusters started, Grant was high on both Jamie's on my list to, to be one of the hosts. It's time to get Grant into this. We, we, we want him, he wants to be in this. And he just did a, a stellar audition tape and then he was part of the team. And Grant's contribution to Mythbusters is really hard to overstate. He is the only one of the five hosts with an engineering degree. <laughs> he was the only one of the five hosts to have an actual degree in what we were doing, which was engineering and science. And when he came on to Mythbusters, the show took a, a complete, our team, we had a completely new dynamic and it was like, we found like our missing member and he brought a skill set and, an, uh, and an intelligence that just completely elevated what we were doing on Mythbusters. He was such an incredibly kind-hearted man. What always impressed me was that when kids would come to the shop to get a tour or stop by, he would drop everything he was doing, get down to their level and ask them all about themselves. Find out what made them tick. Tell stories about when he was a kid. And then he'd walk around the shop just showing all of the cool and magical things that he was interested in. There was a generosity of his spirit that pervaded everything he did on the show. Grant and I have had kind of a, almost a parallel career. Um, I started my career at ILM in the 80s. Uh, I was very young and I competed in Robot Wars and then later BattleBots. And Grant, of course, worked at ILM and also competed in BattleBots. And that's really where we met. Um, he was a little ahead of me um, a few years after me at ILM. And we didn't cross paths there, but we did at BattleBots. Grant took over the, uh, the iterative experimental process at, uh, at R&D. And what they were doing was gradually evolving this robot from a simple shape to a jointed shape and Grant came in and he just shepherded that whole process. And what was awesome was that before every test, they would have this thing and it was hanging from the ceiling and it was gonna be this big dynamic move. And he would begin by announcing what was happening. He would say the date, September 21st, we're at 120 PSI and we're 20 milliseconds delay, all clear downrange. Downrange is clear. In three, two, one, and he would launch this thing. And just the way he would do that would give everybody involved with the project, uh, it felt very legitimate, it felt very safe, it felt like we were, we were, and we were, you know, conducting science. I met Grant and Mahara when I joined the Richmond High School robotics team. He was someone that was passionate about building robots and sharing knowledge and information with others. So after he would get out of work, he would head over to Richmond High School and volunteer his time to help educate youth like myself and others on what it was like to be an engineer, and at the same time instill a passion for building robots. Uh, Grant had a huge impact on my life because he was someone who not only showed you and educated you and directly mentored and guided you, 
but he was able to show you how to develop into a professional and a great overall human being. So at the same time I was learning about engineering and learning more about robots, I was also growing as an individual and thanks to him I, 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 I've grown into the adult that I am um, thanks to his guidance. You know, I think, I think that one of the things that he always valued and that he gave to people was that mentorship that he received from, you know, the, these guys that worked at ILM for 20 years before us. Uh, you know, we had these great role models and he would learn all of that from them. And so he knew the value of this knowledge. And he texted back and was like, oh, absolutely, I know who could do it. I can. And I just felt so, I was very so grateful and excited, but I was also like embarrassed that someone like him would do this stupid project for me. But that was just how Grant was. I mean, he was always down to help other people like reach their goals, even if it was silly with, uh, and he liked to make things. And he was so enthusiastic about other people's passions. He was so enthusiastic about whatever gave you fire lit up his life as well. And he was then so excited to transfer that to the next person, the next, and the next, and the next. You know, you could really see him give back all that he received every day in the way that he worked. You know, he, he often had someone that he, was, he would mentor while he was working. So he would always be working and building up the project, but also building someone else up. And that was one of the really special things that you could notice uh, working with him. Ha <laughs> ha